Hi everybody, Josh Byerly here inside Mission Control Houston. We want to welcome you. We want to say hello to our friends up there at the uh, Murphy Elementary School in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. I'm sitting beside Karen Nyberg, an astronaut and friend of mine who has lived not only on the bottom of the sea, but also here on Earth and also in space. She lived aboard the International Space Station uh, last year. So she's here to take your questions. She also is a native of your home state. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Hi. What inspired you to become an astronaut? Good morning. First of all, good morning to everybody in Minnesota. Um, I decided that I wanted to be an astronaut when I was really young, probably about your age. And honestly, I don't know where that inspiration first came from. Um, you know, potentially I saw the beginning of the space shuttle program and got excited about that. I remember looking up at the moon and thinking how cool it would be to go there. So I think there's a number of things that all work together that inspired me. Okay, my name's Steve Vaughty, and when you were growing up, one day, did, did you want to be an astronaut? If not, wh when did you want to be an astronaut? I did want to be an astronaut. Again, like I said, from when I was about... Um about your age. Uh, that's what I decided I wanted to do. And, and all of my friends knew that that's what I wanted to do. And that's what I worked really hard for all the way through school. Okay. Um, what sacrifices have you had to make and what goals did you have to conquer to get where you are today? There certainly were sacrifices, especially as I was going through school. There were times when my friends would be doing things, especially when I got to college, and I would have to study because I knew that to reach the goals that I had, uh, they were pretty lofty to be an astronaut, and I knew that I'd have to get really good grades. And so there were times when I would sacrifice. My friends would be doing something on a Friday afternoon or evening, and I would stay home and study. But I tried to balance it and also have fun at the same time. What kind of training have you went through, <clears throat> and have it, did it prepare you for going to space? We do a lot of training, actually, uh, when we're training to, to go into space. We do everything from studying the systems. Um, I flew on the space shuttle, so I learned all the systems of the space shuttle. And then also the space station. We have to know how it works so that if something goes wrong, we can fix it. Uh, we also train to do spacewalks. We train to work on the robotic arm. We train to work different science. And a lot of the science that we work, we don't train in depth on what the science means, um, and how. It, but we learn how to work the equipment. Um, and there's other training as well, like learning to be a follower, learning to be a leader, and learning to be a member of a team. And so a lot of the training that I did was just part of my life when I was on sports teams growing up and, um, and uh, going, I would, I'd like to do some backpacking, and that's good training because you learn how to, to um, have survival skills and to work as a team. And so there's, there's a lot of ways you can train that isn't even in the classroom. What missions have you done? What are you researching during those missions? And what do you do with what you learn from the research? In 2008, I had my first mission, and that was on the space shuttle. And we flew to the International Space Station, and we s installed the Japanese laboratory. So there wasn't a lot of research on that flight. That one was mostly getting the space station built. But we did do some research, and a lot of that research was on our bodies and how our bodies react in space. But just recently, I flew a six-month mission on the International Space Station. And that mission was a little different because I was living there, and the goal was doing science. And we do science for a lot of investigators around the world. And so it's not specifically research that I'm doing for me. I'm, we do it on board for um, scientists all over who are trying to discover all sorts of things about, about everything, about how the bodies react in, in microgravity and how materials react and how fluids react and how they can improve things for traveling into space in the future and also improve things on Earth. Um, what is the most difficult space mission that you have had? Can you say that one more time? What is the most difficult space mission that you have had? Well, the two missions that I've had, like I said, one was on the space shuttle and one was on the space station. They were both difficult for different reasons. The space shuttle mission was very busy. We had only 14 days to do a lot of work, and so that was a challenge in that regard. 
the space station mission, the difficulty in there was that you had to live away from home for almost six months. And that can be hard because you're leaving, you're leaving your home, you're leaving your family for a long period of time. So uh, I wouldn't say one was more difficult than the other, but they were difficult in different ways. All right, and thank you for these questions. This is Michael Hare at the Digital Learning Network. A uh, quick message for uh, Murphy Elementary School. If you could please have the children speak up loudly, loud and proud. Uh, we'd love to really hear your questions. It's a little bit difficult with all the noise and mission control, um, so definitely speak up when you're asking your questions. Thanks. Thank you. I just shout a little louder. Come on, you And you go ahead. When in space, what unusual or, or extraordinary things have you seen or experienced? In space, there's a lot of things that I would call extraordinary. Uh, extraordinary in the fact that, that you can float and it really is, it really is an, an, a unique and fun feeling to be able to stand on the wall, put your feet on the wall, flip upside down. And also when you look outside, it's it's very extraordinary. I don't know if I'd call it unusual, but but definitely extraordinary. When you look out at the stars, it's so dark and so black, and the stars almost have colors. It's it's just beautiful. And watching sunrises and sunsets, it's something that you can't put in a video or in pictures to really describe what it's like. So I would definitely call that extraordinary. What about the aurora? And the aurora yeah. is amazing. I don't know if any of you, you live far enough north, you've probably seen the northern lights um, in Minnesota and the green kind of dancing on the horizon. And when you see it from space, you see it over the surface of the earth and it is so beautiful. What is your day-to-day -day life like on the space station? For example, how do you stay clean? How do you sleep? When and how do you eat? Day-to-day -day life is not a lot different, actually, than it is here in what you do. I wake up to an alarm clock every morning and about 6 o'clock, and I would go and um, have some coffee and have a little breakfast and then uh, use the bathroom, um, brush my teeth, get ready uh, for, for like you, the way you guys get ready for school. And then, then we work all day long. Um, we communicate with the folks here in the Mission Control Center and do the science that we're doing for all those people around the world. And we also exercise a couple hours every day. And then in the evening, after we're done with all of our work, we have dinner together, usually as a crew, and then a lot of times call home, talk to my family, um, and by that time the day's done and you set your alarm clock and go to bed and start over again. What are your hobbies in the spaceship or what do you do to pass time? There, you know, the, the weekdays go pretty fast and there's not a lot of time for hobbies. But on the weekends we have, Saturdays we kind of do housekeeping for half the day and then the rest of the day is our own time. And Sunday is mostly our own time. And I actually really enjoyed taking pictures. And I'm not a photographer, but when I was on Space Station I had so much fun playing with the cameras. And the subject matter is fantastic on the Earth. And so I would play with the cameras and try different settings to get beautiful pictures to send to you guys on Earth. Um, but also, I, I I took up some sewing, you may have heard, and tried that a little bit. I thought it would be interesting to see the differences of sewing, because I like to do that. It's one of my favorite hobbies on Earth. And so I, I took up some supplies and, and tried, tried my hand at that on a couple Sunday afternoons when I didn't have anything else to do. Does zero gravity get frustrating while trying to eat, sleep, and do other activities? That's a keen observation. Yes, it actually does. Um, eating, what can happen sometimes, depending on the food, you have your food in a bag, um, a lot of it, and the things that were challenging were rice was one. You put your spoon in, and if it's not really sticky, when you pull your spoon out, little rice, <laughs> pieces of rice go floating all over, and the same thing happened with scrambled eggs and some other things that we ate. That would get frustrating, and so you learn how to, how to eat it after a while. I would put my my spoon in the bag and kind of squish it together so I squish it into a big tight ball of rice before I took my spoon out of the bag so that could get frustrating 
and for sleeping, um, I liked the feeling of something on my back when I sleep like you're laying in a bed. So it would be a little uncomfortable for me to just hang there like you see pictures of a lot of people doing. So I would sleep sideways, sideways in my sleeping bag so that it pushed up against my knees and my back. And I wanted to roll over. And you can't roll over because you're not really laying down. And so I just I felt this need to roll over in my bed and I couldn't. So that got a little frustrating, too. What are the physical effects of being in space and then coming back to Earth? Well, when we, when we go to space, our bodies are amazing. They really try to adapt to, to, to the condition or whatever situation they're in. And because there's no gravity there, they don't, we don't need bones to stand up. We don't need the muscles that we need to move around. So our bodies are really trying to adjust. So we need to counteract that with a lot of exercise. Um, we notice that the fluids in our body kind of shift up. Gravity's not pulling them to our feet. And some people end up looking a little puffy in the face and, and you can definitely feel that in your head. Um, but when we come back to Earth then, it's especially bad if you haven't exercised, but if you, um, your, your body then is trying to, because of the fluid shifts, your body actually has gotten rid of some of its, its blood volume. And when you come back to Earth, your body's trying to rebuild that blood and it makes you really tired. That's one thing I noticed. I was very tired when I came back and I think it's because my body was trying to get back to the, the normal, normal uh, blood levels that it had when it was on Earth before. What kind of forces do you feel when taking off and landing? Well, taking off when the, when the engines first light on the rocket, it's kind of a rumble and you can feel the whole vehicle vibrating and then it starts to lift and you feel the gravity forces building and building and building. You're feeling heavier in your seat. And then once the engines cut off and you're in space about eight minutes after you launch, all of a sudden you notice everything's floating, you feel very light. We're pushed down in our seats, but we could still, our hands could, would lift and everything. Um, coming back is, is a lot different. And I've come back now on the space shuttle and the Soyuz capsule, which the space shuttle lands like an airplane. And it's pretty, it's pretty um, calm. Um, you glide in and you, the, the G loads, so you start to feel about two and a half times your body weight as you come in, but it's not so bad. Well, in the Soyuz, it's just a capsule. And it comes in, and we reached a weight or a G-load of almost five times our body weight. So you felt pretty, pretty heavy. And then a parachute opens, and you're, the capsule lands under a parachute. And when that parachute opens, it's very, you're, the capsule swaying around like this. And it's, it's like, like a bad amusement park ride, I think. Um, it was fun, but it was very, very, very rough. And, uh, and then you land on the land, and so it, it's almost like a small car crash on the ground, and so you feel that too. So um, there, there's a lot of, a lot of feelings that your body gets during both a space shuttle and, and Soyuz landing, and they're very different. <laughs> what kind of emotions do you go through when entering and leaving space? Emotions? What kind of emotions do you mm -hmm. go through? Um, well, I think the main thing leaving, especially this last time when I knew I was going to be leaving for almost six months, um, the day of the day you're leaving is a, is a little strange and you feel sad, you know, you're leaving your family, but also we're trained to really, um, concentrate on the, on the job that we're doing and try not to let the distractions of other things get in the way. And so it's a lot of excitement in that case then. It's almost like the anticipation when Christmas is coming. Um, you're not nervous necessarily, but there's this anxious anxious feeling that you have. You're very excited um, uh, to, to get going. And when you're sitting in the rocket, it almost feels like a simulation, like you've been training. But this time you know that it's for real. And it, it's, uh, it's pretty neat. I, I would say the, the biggest emotion is excitement. <coughs> We read about you in Time for Kids, and we want to know why you picked Sally Ride to be your hero. Mm. 
Yes, Sally Ride. Um, she's definitely a space hero. And actually, I think everybody, all of the women that were selected when she was as an astronaut, she was in the class the first time they selected yeah. female astronauts. And I think all those women really inspired me. Um, and she happened to be the first one from the United States that flew into space. And so I know that... Um, you know, being the being the first of something always takes a little bit extra work, and and so I, I know she worked really hard, and it was just really was an inspiration. And it was when I was a, a child that she was she was doing that, and so I know I definitely read about her also when I was in school, and and just was really inspired by what she was doing. What kind of emergencies do you have to prepare for, and how do you prepare for them? We do have to train for emergencies, that's for sure. There are three big ones that we train for. Um, imagine if we were on the space station, you, you can't just go outside if you have a fire in your house. So we train, we train for a fire. We train for if the, um, you know, th there's a vacuum in space outside of, of the space station and humans can't survive there. So if we got a hole in the space station and it leaked all of the air out, we would be in trouble. So we also train for a depressurization, it's called. We also train for if there's a, a, some kind of a toxic chemical like ammonia, our cooling system that is outside of the space station that cools all of our electronics and us has ammonia in it and that is that's a deadly toxin and so if we were to get some of that in the air in the space station we would have to we would have to take some action so we train very hard here um, on the earth with our crewmates we learn what to do if there's a fire or a depressurization or some toxic spill and if it gets too bad what we would do is get into our Soyuz capsule and come back to earth When in space, how can you tell if when it's day or night, and when do you depend on to know the time? Mm -hmm. That's that's a good question because obviously you know we're we're or orbiting the Earth every 90 minutes and so we see a sunrise and sunset 16 times a day, and so so it could be confusing if you were always looking out the window. But what we do is we use the um, Greenwich Mean Time, which is um, in in Europe. And we, have, we set our clocks, like I said, I set my alarm to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, and then we turn all the lights on. And so all the lights are on in the space station, just like it's daytime. And then when it gets to be bedtime, we just we look at our clocks. We know, we know what time it is, that it's close to bedtime, and we turn all the lights off in the space station. So even though there might be light outside, we don't have the windows. We're not in the middle of the night. We're in our sleep stations, and it's very dark in there. And so, so we don't really get that confused in the middle of the night by what time it is. Okay, in the future, what would you want to discover and why? That's a really good question. Disco what would you like to discover? You know what? I think the, the best thing about discoveries is, or the neatest thing about discoveries, is oftentimes we don't know what they are. We can't predict. I can't really say I want to discover this because what you discover just happens, and that's kind of why it's a discovery. Um, but I think something that we can help with for a space station is to help people that have problems and illnesses. And we can play a part with the science that we're doing on, on space station to help discover some cures for various diseases that people are having or, or come up with medicines to help people that need help. And if I can play a part in that, I would definitely love to do that. How do Newton's laws of motion apply to space? Newton's laws, yes, they apply a lot. There's a lot of instances, um, like if you take an object and put it in the middle of the space station um, and have it so it's not moving relative to the rest of space station, it will just stay right there until it's acted on by something else. And usually that something else is ventilation. There's a fan blowing air, and that air will push that thing. So things usually will start to drift. But if the ventilation was turned off and if nobody touched it, that object would just stay right there and would not move. Um, another thing we deal with when you're working on something, like let's say you're screwing in a screw with a screwdriver here on Earth, your feet are planted on the ground, and you're staying there from gravity, and it's pretty easy to turn it. Well, in space, if you don't hold on to something, as you start turning that screwdriver, you're going to you go turn. right along with it. So, so Newton's laws definitely apply, and you can see it in a lot of instances.
Smart question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a very smart question. Where does all the garbage go on the International Space Station? There certainly is a lot of garbage generated. I think we as a human species generate a lot of trash. And we have vehicles that come up. We call them cargo vehicles. And they bring up supplies for us. And then after we unload all the supplies and the equipment and the food that it brought for us, we load it up with all the trash that we have. And there are a number of these vehicles. And most of them, once we load it up with trash and close the hatches, and it goes away from space station, it burns up in the atmosphere. So all of our trash is just is burned up. <coughs> have you ever been outside of the ISS? I have not. I have not had that unique opportunity. But when I was when I was on space station, my colleagues uh, Chris and Luca and a couple of my Russian colleagues as well were able to do spacewalks. Um, and from what they've told me, it's just it's such an incredible feeling uh, to, to to go out there where it's just you and the spacesuit, and you're looking through your visor, and um, just an incredible feeling. I would love that opportunity sometime. What do the stars and planets look like in space? The stars and planets are very, they look actually very similar to, they, to the way they do when you're on Earth, but they seem a little brighter and a little crisper. They don't twinkle the way that they do on, on the Earth, because on Earth we're looking through our atmosphere, and it just kind of makes everything twinkle a little bit. But from space station, they're very solid, and you see a lot of the colors. Um, in fact, I took some pictures of stars, and it really wasn't until I looked at the pictures that I realized I was seeing these different colors. I saw some that looked more blue, some that looked more yellow, and that just says a lot about the stars and what they're made of and where they are in their, in their history and their lifespan. Um, and there's almost like a depth to it as well that you can see. Um, but other than being a, just a little brighter and a little more distinct in their colors, they look very similar to the way you see them. And the moon does too, right? It kind of looks a little. The, the moon is crisper. the moon is very crisp. Um, I noticed. Um, in particular that the moon to me looked smaller from the space station wow. than it does from on Earth. And I didn't I didn't really pick that out until I came back to Earth and I saw the moon. I was like, wow, it looks so big. <laughs> um, and it really looked a little bigger. And I'm not sure exactly why that is, but, but it, it's definitely crisper um, from space station, but it looks a little smaller, at least it did to me. <coughs> what do you guys do to recycle the oxygen how do you do it, and what is it called? Well, that's definitely a very important thing when we're living in a closed system like the space station. And we have something, uh, we call it the regenerative life support system. And it doesn't just work with the oxygen, it works with a lot of things. And so basically, if you start with the human being, we need a couple, definitely need a couple things. We need oxygen to breathe, and we need water to drink, as well as food and other things. But, uh, and then we'll also give off some things. We give off carbon dioxide, and we give off a little bit of water vapor, water in our sweat, and then also urine. Well, what they do in this regenerative life support system is they, they take the air that we breathe, they can clean out the, the carbon dioxide so it's fresh because we don't want to breathe in that carbon dioxide. And they can, they can clean out the water vapor, and then they can collect that water vapor and our urine, and they can put it through the system that cleans the water, and then we can drink that water, and we can also feed that water to use for other things. And one thing they'll do with that water is separate the hydrogen and the oxygen and basically get rid of the hydrogen, and now we have oxygen. And so then they can feed that oxygen back into the fresh air that we've taken the carbon dioxide out of and use it all over again. So it's a pretty neat system, and it's important for space station because we can't bring up fresh water all the time, and we can't bring up fresh oxygen to breathe. So um, that's, the, that's the way we do it on space station, and it's, it's a pretty neat system. You need a special type of clothing while going into space? We do wear special clothing when we launch. We're in a spacesuit, and the reason we wear a spacesuit is because we can, just in case there's a depressurization of our space capsule, we have a spacesuit that can hold the pressure and keep us alive. And so when we're launching, and then again when we land, we wear a spacesuit. But when we're in the space station, we just dress like this. We can dress in a, a polo shirt and shorts, or a t-shirt, or just like you do at home. Well, they're giving us a signal that that's going to wrap it up for us. We want to thank you guys. Thank you, Karen, very much. And uh, we we'll hope you guys have a great day there in Minnesota. Thanks for joining us.
Thanks, everyone. I enjoyed Thank talking you. to you. I'll see you later.